another episode of Tennessee Fro is Reading. How I'm your host, Felicia Baxter. Join me as I celebrate Black History Month by researching and discussing Margaret Garner and her family tragedy from Kentucky to freedom, as well as the poet Phyllis Wheatley. I'm continuing to read about Ida, the race worker versus mother and wife how I'm completely in love with Vern the Dragon and Squib in High Fire, and also his metrosexual friend. I have to look up Woodard, Woodard or Wooten or something like that, as well as reading from Not My Family, um, the chapter Always Be Cute and discussing uh, how I've reorganized the table of contents as well as rewriting each individual chapter as well as talking about the process of getting it re-edited, creating a buzz, and then um, hopefully garnering up some other uh, chats on booktube as well as other interviews. I'll also discuss uh, my track and my goal of a thousand downloads or busts by the end of the month. I'm actually well on my way to that. I'm really excited about that. And I'm picking up listeners from all over the Southeast and across the United States and the world. It's actually pretty cool. And thank you for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I've enjoyed creating it. So welcome back to the episode. So one of the things I've discovered in my trek to get sponsorships and more listeners and to be able to uh, sponsor myself as well as fund my uh, expensive uh, passion project, which is my podcast, as well as my blog. Well, I've signed up as an advertiser. Um, Hopefully I'll be an influencer for something called Writer's Block Coffee, which I received my first shipment about two weeks ago. And I've also uh, bought some Neato swag. I haven't been back to North Carolina to pick up my latest shipment um, because I had to replace my favorite cup um, as well as I didn't get my ground coffee in enough time for my um, talk at University of Florida. But I'm looking to pick up um, my swag in a couple of months. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to use it in my upcoming um, talks. And I'll be able to distribute them to people uh, that would like um, to uh, sample the coffee as well as get my updated book. But the coffee itself is a combination of gently roasted and perfectly roasted coffee beans. And it's so hilarious because my purchase actually comes up on um, the website. But anyways... Actually, both of them, Lumberton, (laughs) as well as Fayetteville, because that's where I live and that's where I actually ordered um, the previous swag. But this coffee is such perfectly roasted. It makes a good pairing with my morning uh, black coffee uh, with brown sugar cubes and fresh fruit. I love just sitting back and the whole process of making coffee and grounding it up. Um, and uh, putting it in the drip uh, for perfectly percolated coffee is something that I look forward to in my morning routine. Um, You will actually be transformed uh, by this coffee and you will enjoy it just as much as I do, I'm sure. 
We got people that use this as promotional uh, swag, as well as a writer that's going to Italy and he's taking, of course, his computer, as well as some writer's block coffee to enjoy um, in the land of some serious coffee makers or drinkers. So why don't you join me and navigate to writersblockcoffee.com forward slash Tennessee Fro as well as entering in the promotional code uh, TENFRO is reading to get a percentage off of your total purchase as well as off of shipping. Now back to my podcast. This month is we celebrate Black History Month. I am still reading probably one of my uh, most ambitious reads of the year, the 800 page biography of Ida B. Wells. Um, Ida, a sword among lions. I'm up to the part uh, where she's actually having to make a choice between um, motherhood and being uh, what they call a race worker. She actually, in her notoriety and her zeal, because what she wants to do is uplift the, the race by any means necessary. And she was militant before militancy was cool. She was the, doing her work before the likes of Malcolm X actually uh, came uh, to fruition when he was only a uh, sparkle in his mother's eye. And she did it all by getting married uh, to Ferdinand Barnett and popping out four kids and being and having going on the road while having a nursing child. All of these things were just unheard of in the 1890s, but Ida actually did it. And it was through my reading about Ida B. Wells that I was able to find out or I started to learn uh, more about other women. And one of them was uh, Margaret. Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner and her tragic life was actually uh, the basis of Toni Morrison's, the late great Toni Morrison's book, Beloved. Margaret Garner was born around 1800 and some odd, and she was enslaved in Kentucky. She was the probably the child of rape of her white slave owners and her uh, mother and her African-American mother. She herself was also assaulted probably by the rapey Gaineses and had two children uh, by her uh, slave owner. She and she was married and her family members basically packed up and ran across to Ohio to get on the um, uh, Underground Railroad. But before they could escape to Canada, He actually, um, the house was surrounded by federal authorities to enforce the fact that she was not a person and she wasn't a mother, therefore. So what her plan was to kill all of her children and then herself rather than return to slavery. She slit the throat of her two-year-old daughter and had also injured her other three children. But before she could finish the job and then kill herself, she was actually pulled out of the house and arrested. The abolitionists wanted her to be brought up on murder charges because that would mean that she actually killed a person, and th- which was her child, and therefore she was a person. But all she was actually convicted of was the destruction of property. After the children and she, after the conviction and then subsequent uh, selling 
to a relative of the Gaines down south. She would die of typhoid fever in 1858, broken hearted and in a worse condition than she ever could dream imagine of. But she risked her life for freedom and she would rather commit murder instead of returning the child or her children and herself back to slavery. This was the kind of uh, simple kind of dread and awfulness born out of slavery. And these stories are told over and over again. But the flip side of that, besides Ida, who saw the reason why I know about Miss um, Garner or Miss Peggy Garner was the fact that Ida B. Wells actually idolized her. But I also uh, was reintroduced to someone that I didn't really know much about. And I was also um, interested in seeing if there were uh, other photos or other drawings of Miss Phyllis Wheatley. Circa, circa 1753 to 1784, she died at the age of 31, probably of purpura, meaning she had uh, overwhelming sepsis, probably from group B strep. But I digress. Miss Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American woman to publish a book of poetry. She was born in West Africa and she was sold into slavery at the age of seven or eight before she was transported to the to North America. She was purchased by the Wheatley family of Boston, who, against normal convention, taught her to read and write and encouraged her poetry when they saw that she had talented. It was on a trip with the master's son where they sought publication of her work. And she was actually, through his efforts, was aided in meeting prominent people who became patrons. Her poems on various subjects and religious and morals was published September 1st, 1773. It bought her fame not only in England and in America, in England, but also in America, where George Washington actually praised her work. And a few years later, another uh, African-American poet, Jupiter Heyman, praised her work in a poem of his own. She was not... Soon after the publication of her work, she was emancipated um, and she married about 1778. However, she would birth two children that died in infants. And then when her husband was in prison for debt in 1784, she fell into poverty and she died of illness. Her last child soon died thereafter. There for another tragic death about a talent a talent that was taken away from us way too soon both Phyllis Wheatley and Margaret Garner but even in their short lives and tragic lives they give inspiration to anyone that would bother to research and hear their story so welcome back to the episode so one of the things I've discovered in my trek to get sponsorships and more listeners and to be able to uh, sponsor myself as well as fund my uh, expensive uh, passion project, which is my podcast, as well as my blog. Well, I've signed up as a, an advertiser Um, Hopefully I'll be an influencer for something called Writer's Block Coffee, which I received my first shipment about two weeks ago. And I've also uh, bought some Neato swag. I haven't been back to North Carolina to pick up my latest shipment um, because I had to replace my favorite cup. Um, as well as I didn't get my ground coffee in enough time for my um, talk at University of Florida, but I'm looking to pick up 
um, my swag in a couple of months. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to use it in my upcoming um, talks and I'll be able to distribute them to people uh, that would like um, to uh, sample the coffee as well as get my updated book. But the coffee itself is a combination of gently roasted and perfectly roasted coffee beans. And it's so hilarious because my purchase actually comes up on um, the website. But anyways, actually both of them, Lumberton (laughs) as well as Fayetteville, because that's where I live and that's where I actually ordered um, the previous swag. But this coffee is such perfectly roasted. It makes a good pairing with my morning uh, black coffee. Uh, with brown sugar cubes and fresh fruit. I love just sitting back and the whole process of making coffee and grounding it up um, and uh, putting it in the the drip uh, for perfectly percolated coffee is something that I look forward to in my morning routine. Um, You will actually be transformed uh, by this coffee and you will enjoy it just as much as I do, I'm sure. We got people that use this as promotional uh, swag as well as a writer that's going to Italy and he's taking, of course, his computer as well as some writer's block coffee to enjoy um, in the land of some serious coffee makers or drinkers. So why don't you join me and navigate to writersblockcoffee.com forward slash Tennessee Fro as well as entering in the promotional code uh, TENFRO is reading to get a percentage off of your total purchase as well as off of shipping. Now back to my podcast. This month as we celebrate Black History Month, I am still reading probably one of my uh, most ambitious reads of the year, the 800 page biography of Ida B. Wells. Um, Ida, a sword among lions. I'm up to the part uh, where she's actually having to make a choice between um, motherhood and being uh, what they call a race worker. She actually, in her notoriety and her zeal, because what she wants to do is uplift the, the race by any means necessary. And she was militant before militancy was cool. She was the, doing her work before the likes of Malcolm X actually uh, came uh, to fruition when he was only a uh, sparkle in his mother's eye. And she did it all by getting married uh, to Ferdinand Barnett and popping out four kids and being and having going on the road while having a nursing child. All of these things were just unheard of in the 1890s, but Ida actually did it. And it was through my reading about Ida B. Wells that I was able to find out or I started to learn uh, more about other women. And one of them was uh, Margaret. Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner and her tragic life was actually uh, the basis of Toni Morrison's, the late great Toni Morrison's book, Beloved. Margaret Garner was born around 1800 and some odd, and she was enslaved in Kentucky. She was the probably the child of rape of her white slave owners and her uh, mother and her African-American mother. She herself was also assaulted probably by the rapey Gaineses and had two children uh, by her uh, slave owner. She and she was married and her family members basically packed up and ran across to Ohio to get on the um, uh, 
uh, Underground Railroad. But before they could escape to Canada, he actually, um, the house was surrounded by federal authorities to enforce the fact that she was not a person and she wasn't a mother, therefore. So what her plan was to kill all of her children and then herself rather than return to slavery. She slit the throat of her two-year-old daughter and had also injured her other three children. But before she could finish the job and then kill herself, she was actually pulled out of the house and arrested. The abolitionists wanted her to be brought up on murder charges because that would mean that she actually killed a person, and th- which was her child, and therefore she was a person. But all she was actually convicted of was the destruction of property. After the children and she, after the conviction and then subsequent uh, selling to a relative of the Gaines down south, she would die of typhoid fever in 1858, broken hearted and in a worse condition than she ever could dream imagine of but she risked her life for freedom and she would rather commit murder instead of returning the child or her children and herself back to slavery this was the kind of uh simple kind of dread and awfulness born out of slavery and these stories are told over and over again but the flip side of that besides Ida who saw the reason why I know about Miss um, Garner or Miss Peggy Garner was the fact that Ida B. Wells actually idolized her but I also was reintroduced to someone that I didn't really know much about. And I was also um, interested in seeing if there were uh, other photos or other drawings of Miss Phyllis Wheatley. Circa, Circa 1753 to 1784, she died at the age of 31, probably of purpura, meaning she had uh, overwhelming sepsis probably from group B strep, but I digress. Miss Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American woman to publish a book of poetry. She was born in West Africa and she was sold into slavery at the age of seven or eight before she was transported to the to North America. She was purchased by the Wheatley family of Boston, who, against normal convention, taught her to read and write and encouraged her poetry when they saw that she had talented. It was on a trip with the master's son where they sought publication of her work. And she was actually, through his efforts, was aided in meeting prominent people who became patrons. Her poems on various subjects and religious and morals was published September 1st, 1773. It bought her fame not only in England and in America, in England, but also in America, where George Washington actually praised her work. And a few years later, another uh, African-American poet, Jupiter Heyman, praised her work in a poem of his own. She was not, soon after the publication of her work, she was emancipated um, and she married about 1778. However, she would birth two children that died in infants and then when her husband was in prison for debt in 1784 she fell into poverty and she died of illness her last child soon died thereafter there for another tragic death about a talent a talent that was taken away from us way too soon both Phyllis Wheatley 
and Margaret Garner. But even in their short lives and tragic lives, they give inspiration to anyone that would bother to research and hear their story. So here, so here we go, rounding around the mountain. Um, I am well on to my goal of um, at minimum of a thousand downloads of all of my uh, publishing publications. Uh, right now, it stands that, wow, I'm even higher than I was at the 650 when I actually started writing the script for this podcast. I am up to 668 uh, all-time downloads of all times with 165 over the last 30 days, meaning since um, January, 85 downloads just this past week with 10 being yesterday. And I wonder, does this tell me? what those 10 words but it seems like everyone uh seems to be very interested in my talking about Picard and Star Trek um I'm going to actually probably have to do uh more discussions and I'm going to continue to do discussions of that um I think everyone likes uh when I talk about the movies that I actually watch um, and um, also how Ida B. Wells is dynamite, um, giving not only adage to the fact that I'm still reading her biography, but also uh, with binge watching Good Times, which I can probably continue to do. But Star Trek and my Star Wars... Uh, Dr. Monsieur tells me you should be on the Actually, that should be Star Trek, Star Trek fan fiction. I basically should. Uh, I need to rename um, that particular podcast because it's actually Star Trek fan fiction. But I'm also I write Star Wars fan fiction, I guess, too. So go figure. Um, I also have noticed the numbers have come back. The vast majority or the highest majority of my listeners are concentrated in the United States with approximately 65% of listeners uh, in the continental United States with the highest amount of listeners finally coming out of Tennessee with uh, eight, this, it was about eight total downloads um, at when I actually first uh, uh, downloaded the um, this data um, this past weekend. But let's see who is actually um, listening um, in the U.S. Actually, uh, we're up to nine all-time downloads in the great state of Tennessee uh, with increase in numbers from Illinois, New York, and um, Virginia. I find that actually very amazing. Um, No listeners in Canada or Australia at this time. But there's still three listeners in Spain, which I think is absolutely crazy. And a big shout out to uh, anyone in Spain that bothers to tune in. I'm hopeful that you guys are finding and liking certain um, things. So if you are listening in Spain and just hit me up. Um, at tinfro is reading at gmail.com and let me know uh, what your favorite uh, podcast uh, was and I'll make sure I try to include that type of content in subsequent episodes but so I was able to actually uh, rewrite Uh, another chapter of part four of my book, Not My Family, that I actually wanted to share uh, with the listening audience. Not only, and as I said in previous episodes, not only have I changed 
uh, the basically the whole structure of the book and table of contents. I've actually added more explanation or I guess more content in each one of the chapters. And one of the chapters that I actually did rewrite and I'm working on uh, re-editing it probably as I'm speaking, but also uh, for uh, when the book is overall edited is called ABC, Always Be Cute. And it goes as this. Hurricane Mara and Grandma M never went out without their natural Chanel Ultra Sheen lipstick. And they said, always present your best foot forward because you never know who you're going to see. I was of the adage, if it required reapplication or upkeep, I wasn't doing it. And I went natural because spending hours in a natu- in a beauty salon was less than appealing. I would pick simple style and self-care and makeup tips for my sister, paternal aunts and cousins and grandmother. They ooze a simple style and natural grace that stars like Alicia Keys emulated and pulled off with some success. It wasn't as if they were playing dress up or applying theatrical makeup for a big performance. They made me understand that our clothes and makeup reflect our inner peace and makeup enhances our natural beauty. So when we live to love and love ourselves, everything reflects that. It would take me months to get into the habit of taking a moment to beautify myself and pick out just the right ensemble to reflect my mood and well-being. I'm sure this is going to be a lifelong pursuit. As I transition back to being a Purcell, it was always like, oh, home week, meeting family and cousins. I lived amongst and played tag with in San Padre, but I would meet people from Maria Butler's past at the same time. Most of the time it went well, then other times, not so much. With my many ex-boyfriends, it could go out of the way. I traveled throughout the continental U.S. to work and dated in a few of the states. The Purcells, for the most part, were concentrated in the southeastern portion of the U.S. and Texas and even Florida. The weekends were dedicated to impromptu family gatherings, gatherings in Dallas, Austin, Houston, and of course, San Padre. And for the gamblers along the Gulf Coast, starting at Texarkana and Bossier City. We would get caught up and bond over crab legs and penny slots at the casinos. Contrary to popular belief, I never dated many men, nor did I date well. I had three long-term relationships as an adult and all ended badly. From the beginning, Maria and definitely Franny was not an equal match for any of these little boys. All of us were ill-equipped for who I was to become and where I was to go. Frank, the Air Force captain, Aaron, the pharmacist, and Fitzroy, the Miami-Dade detective, made for interesting conversation and explanation when I would meet them again with my family at different times. When I met each loser again, I had Purcell back up. I was also beginning to become my most fabulous and dropped half a stone in weight because I was always on the go with my family. I would see Frank after he retired from the military and had picked up all the weight I lost at the Austin Grand Hyatt after a run with my brothers. We all would crash into the restaurant for breakfast on the open air terrace before the Texas sun burned all the coolness out the air. We were all pretty sweaty. Frank came over after recognizing me, but I really didn't place him at first. He had changed so much. He looked older and married life had not done him well. My oldest brother, James, is very intuitive and could read anyone. This would help him throughout his career as a ranger and as a private investigator. James looked at him and said, he has that pinch Harold look of a husband of a nagging wife. Once he reminded me who the heck he was, I introduced him to my brothers. He had the audacity to act jealous because I was with the coolest guys in the state, my brothers. He recognized Bryce instantly because of his days with the Dallas Cowboys. His face changed from shock to anger to jealousy to relief, all within a flash. He said, 
Oh, yeah, they had to be related to you. As if I couldn't pull a good-looking tall man. He was deflecting his own pathetic self-hate. I, on the other hand, looked like the swimmer and runner I'd become to keep up with my brothers. I told my brothers about our brief relationship and would go on to tell Frank how I lived in Chattanooga and San Padre because of my family. He asked if I was still practicing and I told him I was chief editor of health economics, print and online and had developed their mobile application. He seemed shocked that I had managed to do all that in such a short period of time. I, the little nobody from Virginia, had beaten him again in spite of his refusal to screw me without marrying me. How you like me now, Baldy? The mini reunion was broken up by a short, caramel-colored woman who might have been pretty once upon a time. She had creases in her forehead and around her mouth from perpetual disappointment and an everlasting frown. I watched my ex's face drop and he seemed to withdraw into his own uncertainty. She was really odd. It seemed like she didn't care to be introduced to any of us and didn't expect to be introduced to any of us. My brother stood up respectfully when she came up. She just stood next to Frank and sighed, and she excused herself, averting his, and he excused himself, excuse me, averting his eyes as they left without a goodbye or an introduction. We shrugged and shook our heads. If it hadn't been for our family, we would have been trapped and broken individuals too. Aaron, the pharmacist, whose dreams of becoming a physician were thwarted by a horrible accident on his way to taking the medical school entrance exams, would remain in retail to support his family and three wives. I would meet him again after his toddler son ran into my father, while Tony, Hurricane Mara, and my grandparents were at the Blue Moon in Dallas for a weekend family brunch. I looked happy and flawless, and he looked gray and pinched. As his son sat quietly looking up at my father, I made the introductions and explanation of how I had been reunited with my birth father and family. And he told me how he never fulfilled his dream of going to medical school. He ended up in retail to his chagrin and I am sure his mother's disappointment. He told me I looked almost the same as that summer in 1992. We met while being interns for the Space Life Sciences program from, through NASA. He went back to Florida A&M to complete his degree in pharmacy, and I would stay another two years, initially at the Kennedy Space Center and then working in Houston on the Orbiter Project before returning to Florida to complete medical school. He had graduated by then and married and divorced his first, her, his first wife also. But all the disappointments and what ifs of our youths dissolved as my more family members and friends joined the ever expanding party that day at the blue moon. Maybe it was the margaritas made of Patron that helped, but that bunch at the blue moon, excuse me, that, but that brunch at the blue moon was amazing and enjoyable. And I knew I felt in a while and Aaron felt the same. As I walked him out, he whispered, I have never been as happy as I was that summer. I never found that happiness with anyone since. With that, the valet brought his car around. I gave him a tight hug and waved goodbye. Hurricane seeing my dilemma said, please tell me you are not mourning the loss of that loser. (laughs) According to Merritt, Every professional woman, even of Purcell stock, has to run the gauntlet of you losers. You just have to recognize them for what they are and not get stuck. Mara's dating history was more eclectic than mine and more international than mine, but it was still filled with losers. She dated a Chinese ex-ballet dancer choreographer who would admit his bisexuality and subsequent homosexuality during a family reunion after cruising one of our more fabulous cousins. She used He used her as a beard for a number of years, even after they split because his ultra 
conservative family was not accepting of a Texas raisin, they definitely never would have accepted another man in his life. They still are friends and go to all the Broadway show openings in New York. She dated a British Episcopalian priest, marked the start of him, which marked the start of her religious period. He was remarkably well-read and traveled, but very backward in his belief. He was a gun-toting right-wing Republican. He took his move and acclamation to Texas to the extreme. When she was promoted through Genotech and required to travel, he freaked out when she wouldn't quit her job to marry him and move into the parish. He was eventually arrested in a raid on an extreme malicious sect compound that was raided by the ATF. He was deported after that in a serving of prison sentence in Great Britain for making threats to parliament. She hid her success from her Nigerian evangelical minister. He was a self-proclaimed doctor of divinity and never recognized her actual advanced degree. He definitely could not understand her work in genetics and molecular biology. They were done when he refused to introduce her to anyone in his home church and he married a virgin who was chosen for him. She found out about it from an online announcement in the Dallas Morning News. They, the uh, minister and his wife, would divorce less than a year later and he was caught up in a fraud scheme and was eventually deported. He called her from the detention center to talk about getting Bryce to represent him pro bono, of course. That would never happen and she would wave at him as he was led shackled to the prison transporter back to Nigeria. She would marry an an ex-linebacker from the Houston Oilers. Their marriage would tank, but she would experience true love and respect. After he began to rage and have bouts of depression, he was diagnosed with that post-concussive syndrome. After their marriage disintegrated, they remained friends. He was part of a large settlement from the NFL. Fitzroy was my Miami not so one night stand who would roll up on me having eggs and mimosas with Hurricane Grandma and my aunts during Girls Weekend in South Beach. I love Florida almost as much as I love Texas and every Caribbean island. For years, I would return to South Beach for the Food and Wine Festival, and I had a place on the FIU board for a number of years. And besides, this year, I look damn good. My afro was puffy from a series of cocoa, coconut, avocado, cream rinses, and omega oils. And I was wearing my favorite flowy jersey floor limp dress. He was in plain clothes, but what I remember was the wide grin of recognition as he approached our table. Franny, I thought you hated the beach, but it seems like you're picking up extra hours with the local security in South Beach. He told me he was following me again on Instagram and was so happy to hear about me finding my family. He told me I looked absolutely radiant and did I have that inner glow when I was in medical school. And I said, yes, it was buried under anxiety and depression from always feeling scared. I would fill out and have to go back to Virginia to work at Hardee's. We all laughed and he took one last look at me and said, well, I have to have a meeting soon. Maria or Fran, it was great seeing you. And with that, he beat a fast retreat. I sat in a cloud of coconut and gardenia, wiggled a few few of my fingers goodbye, sat back to enjoy my family. I was able to block out his long quizzical look at the as the platter of fruit in a second round of mimosas arrived. Hurricane and Grandma aptly sized up the situation by stating that confusing lust and hot sex for a real connection is always a mistake. Grandma M had been married to my grandma, my grandfather for for 60 years and couldn't understand how most couples threw away their marriages like Kleenexes. She would stand by the hard work required in a good relationship. 
She hated that Sex in the City did for a relationship and was ticked how a fictional character warped an entire generation of young women to think and be shallow. She agreed with the fashion of the skinny white women and the resilience of how they bounced back from their mistakes. But what bothered her the most was the lack of family and how they slept around with obviously broken individuals. She saw fleeting mothers and Miranda would have her only child out of wedlock before she married, separated from, and reunited with the kid's father. She envied their sexual freedom and ex exploration, but she found them all vapid and flawed. They thought skinny ass Carrie Bradshaw flitting around New York had fucked up an entire generation of women, one pair of $700 Manolo shoes at a time. They all admired Samantha because she put her sexuality out there, but they felt sorry for her when she selected flawed individuals and got burned. Her longest relationship with a fine actor was all they could fantasize about. My grandmother was always a hopeful romantic, and she always grateful for finding Big Sam and becoming a part of the Purcell family. Both of her younger sisters would marry relatives of the Purcell family, making the close-lit nature of the tribe even more inclusive. Grandma M's family was remarkable and a testament to emigration. Their family fled Algiers in World War I and poverty had almost killed what the war did not. Her parents would remain together for their lives and would spend the last days walking the beach and collecting shells at San Padre. She was a realist and recognized not everyone needed to be married to be in a healthy relationship. She was satisfied with their intimate life with Gramps, yuck. But she wished she could have more time to explore sexually, double yuck. She was hopeful that dating could lead to marriage, but she didn't think it was required in our relationships. She was hopeful that that younger generation, Mara, I, our cousins included, and her nieces would not opt to skip all the drama because it was a part of life. She always prayed that we would be just as lucky and successful as they were. The family would grow and be positively remembered and replicated and not only in the conventional sense. And that's how I want to end my episode of my podcast this week. And as I always tell people, my podcast in reality is my form of entertainment and a form of therapy. But if you're searching for help and directions and your struggles with depression, anxiety and addiction and you don't have a podcast, call 1-800-273-8255 available uh, for chat and to unpack some of the issues of uh, psychological issues of the day. There is an online chat feature at suicideprevention.lifeline.org forward slash chat forward slash. If vodka or other substances are your problem, call 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357 um, to get help with your addictions. Then there are applications like Talkspace and Doctor On Demand that for a fraction of the cost of conventional therapy, they can actually meet you right where you were. And just remember the journey is hard and it is okay not to be okay. And it's okay to ask for help. Don't forget to navigate to Angels Inc. for all special offers and updates on nerd news. And again, drop me a line at tennesseeforwardsreading at gmail.com or leave a two minute voicemail at 423-463-0658. If your message is non trolly I may actually read it on air. If you are tired of freeloading and want to become a patron, navigate to patron.podbean.com forward slash the talking fro to leave me a tip or to become a sponsor for my show. Uh, leave a tip at paypal.me forward slash Felicia D-A-I um, and I greatly appreciate it. And remember, my goal is to reach a thousand downloads by the end of the month, which will also make me more attractive um, to advertisers that want to support the dream and finance the dream. And again, I hope you will continue to support, share the podcast and download and make comments and enjoy the podcast just as much as I enjoy creating it. And I hope you will return next week for more 
of the reading from my rewritten book, Not My Family, and for other updates and nerd news. And I hope you have a great day.